Operation Unleash the Imprisoned Impulse. Welcome to another episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Pellegrino, and I'm here with our amazing guest, Dr. Christopher Kent. Uh, on the podcast, each week we break down the most relevant chiropractic science and philosophy necessary to empower you to change the health of your community from the inside out. So with that, uh, as you guys may know, uh, I am, have this weird obsession with believing that if you and your practice members or patients actually understand what the heck is going on in chiropractic and why it works, that they're more likely to actually continue care, refer their friends and family. So uh, I took articles like this, what we're going to be discussing today, and broke it down into a patient newsletter. So if you guys want that for your office, you can jump on chiroagemedia.com. So today, we're going to be discussing with Dr. Kent a couple different things. So we're going to be focusing on and kind of letting the conversation go, this uh, article that was recently published uh, at two places. I see, Dr. Kent, you sent me, it was in Archives of Neurology and Neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, as well as it was in the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research. Correct. So it's called Proposed Neurobiological Processes Associated with Models of Vertebral Subluxation, including disaffrontation, dyskinesia, dyspinesis, dysautonomia, neuroplasticity, and effect affectic transmission. So don't try to say that 10 times fast because you probably won't be able to. But this is, uh, <laughs> if you guys have done safety pin cycle, disaffrontation, the four dimensional model, this is almost like an update we were discussing, Dr. Kent, right? Exactly. You know, it's really a lot simpler than it seems. Um, I recall when I was shopping for a career and trying to find out more about chiropractic, uh, I had kind of an interesting experience in that uh, my then best friend was encouraging me to see a chiropractor, and I had no idea what a chiropractor was. So I asked my mother, who worked at the medical college, and uh, she said, a chiropractor is someone who cracks your bones. And I said, cracks your bones? You mean they fracture? She said, I guess they must. You can hear them snap. And I thought to myself, why would anyone want that done? So I had a contradiction in that my friend, who was seemingly rational and certainly ambulatory, um, was talking about how wonderful chiropractic was, and my mother's talking about cracking bones. Yeah. So I thought, how can I find out more about this without risking life and limb? And I called a local chiropractor and told him that I was doing a paper on chiropractic for school. Could I come and interview him? And he said, sure. So went to his office. Um, he received me immediately, and he said, okay, go ahead and ask your questions. And I asked him that question that we've all been asked so many times, and that is, what is it that chiropractors do? And his answer really, I think, is a springboard for where, where all of this has gone. He said, chiropractic's based on four simple ideas. First, the body's a self-healing mechanism. Cut your finger, it heals. Cut the finger of a corpse, it doesn't. Life is what heals. He said, second, the nervous system is the master system of the body that every dimension of the human experience is processed through the nervous system. Uh, every thought, every word, every deed, every movement, every motion, every emotion is processed through the nervous system. And this is where the juice is. He said, third, when there's interference with the function of the nervous system, not only can it compromise your physical well-being, but because it distorts your perception of the world and compromises your ability to respond to the world, it can have psycho-emotional consequences too. And when this happens to a significant number of people in a society, you have a sick society. And he said, what I do as a chiropractor is locate and correct the cause of that interference. That made sense then. And the deeper we get into this onion that we're peeling, this, this nervous system, this vertebral subluxation phenomenon, um, the more I relate back to what he said way back when. And we've all talked about the safety pin cycle. We're very familiar with that. And we're also familiar with what some call conceptual definitions of subluxation. You know, Stevenson's classic model of a loss of juxtaposition, occlusion of an opening, impingement of nerve, and interference with mental impulses. And, uh, you know, some more sophisticated ones as well. But the thing that was missing was an operational definition that would work with all techniques. So what's an operational definition? How does that differ from the other types? Well, an operational definition simply is how do you do it? 
how do you determine a person is subluxated? And we have a lot of technique specific operational definitions, um, you know, where a person might use static palpation, motion palpation, leg checks, uh, things of this nature. Uh, you know, that's how they do it. So we said, well, what can we come up with that has reliable and valid technology associated with it that could conceivably be used with any technique and that's congruent with what we're doing? So we came up. Patrick Gentipo and I with the 4D model. And the first element of that is disafferentation. Now, what in the world is that? Well, it's really not a new idea. I'm, I'm kind of perversely amused by people who think they've created something new, uh, you know, neurologically based chiropractic. Well, that started with this dude in Iowa back in 1895. <laughs> um, you know, disafferentation. Well, you know, the safety pin cycle followed not long after. This really isn't new stuff. The idea with disafferentation is that on the afferent leg, the central nervous system is dependent on the integrity of information on what's going on in the periphery. Um, you know, how do I know that my arm is out here somewhere with my eyes closed? Well, you know, I'm getting this, this afferent input. And back in the 1960s, uh, a group of chiropractors, specifically um, Marshall Himes and Andy Peterson, came up with a really innovative concept. Uh, I said, man, this is the coolest thing I've seen in a long time. And that was the notion of a neural image. And the neural image is the body's perception of itself in relation to its environment. So what determines the integrity of the neural image is the integrity of, you know, this vast array of sensors that we have out there. Um, you know, if you went to school back when I did, you know, I said chemistry was very easy. We only had four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Um, <laughs> but when we, when we studied um, the structure of the spine, we were taught that the disc had no direct nerve supply. Right. Uh, that the ligaments didn't have a nerve supply. And uh, that pain was due to either periosteum or muscle, because that's the only stuff that had the receptors. But back in the 80s, uh, Bogduk and some other investigators, Mendel, Wink, Zimney, some others, looked at the nerve that is associated with the intervertebral disc. And there, there, there's a lot of nerve stuff in there especially in the outer annulus. Um, also, uh, you know, white, looking at mechanoreceptors in the, in the posterior joints. And, and some more recent stuff, looking at sensors in the meninges and the like. Um, what we know is that the intelligence of the body has created a very sophisticated sensory system in there. Um, you know, in the upper cervical spine and the muscles, we have you know, a tremendous density of receptors in there. And some have even proposed that these muscles are as much um, mechanoreceptors as they are movers. So we've got all this stuff that's giving the central nervous system information concerning position and motion. And if that's compromised, uh, we have this phenomenon known as disafferentation. So how can you measure that? Well, there are a number of ways. Um, the classic is just palpation for tenderness. You know, a lot of chiropractors have done that. Uh, that's probably been going on since Didi's time. You know, is it tender here? Uh, you can get a little bit more specific and measure the amount of pressure you're applying so that when you say, is this tender? Yes. Post adjustment, is this tender now? Well, you're not pushing as hard. Well, you know, if you measure the amount of pressure with an ergometer, you can't fool yourself. So uh, that's the that's the afferent side. That's the stuff coming in. That's the body's perception of itself in the context of its environment. And, um, you know, like the late great Fred Barge used to say, there's only one cause of disease, and that's inability of the body to comprehend itself and its environment. So on the efferent leg, we have three pieces. We have dyskinesia as the first, and that's voluntary motion. If you're unable to effectively execute a voluntary motion, you've got dyskinesia. So how does dyskinesia work? Well, a lot of people have noticed, and there have been some studies to the effect, that individuals under chiropractic care sometimes report improved athletic performance. 
And as we know, most major league athletic teams have chiropractors on their staff. Why is that improved performance? So if you're trying to throw the ball and you don't have it go where you want it to, um, hmm, there's a problem with dyskinesia. Your body's not able to uh, execute the move that you have in your mind. And, you know, there have been some research studies done on this where they look at things like they'll have a person uh, wear a strap on their head that has a laser that they're supposed to point at a spot. And they found that individuals uh, pre-chiropractic care uh, sometimes have difficulty repositioning that spot and they do it much better when their nervous system is working without interference. So that's dyskinesia. That's the voluntary part. The last two are the ones that really excite me because here we're talking about the asymptomatic subluxation potentially. Um, the third item is dyspanesis. And I came across this word after I had had my stroke back in 1987. And they had told my family that I would probably be fertilizing chrysanthemums within a few days. <laughs> And I thought, well, you know, even though I did much better than that after an adjustment, but that's a different story. Um, after I was discharged, I said, I don't know how much time I have left, so I don't want to waste any time. And that meant putting a copy of Dorland's Dictionary in the Merck Manual on the toilet tank. So even that time wasn't wasted. <laughs> and I would thumb through Dorland's looking for something, you know, to expand my vocabulary. And one day I crossed the term dysponesis. And it just shocked me. You know, like I've often said, it was kind of like a cattle prod to the gonads. I said, whoa, this is amazing stuff, dysponesis. And it comes from the word ponos, meaning exertion or work. So what they're really talking about is an inappropriate utilization of the body's energy systems. And the idea behind dysponesis actually started with some people in mental health. You know, there, there, there was a pair of shrinks who said, we noticed that when people have specific psychopathologies, they have identifiable postural and gait patterns. What could be causing that? And they said, hmm, problems in energy expenditure, asymptomatic, or as they put it, covert errors that are associated with functional disorders. And they said, how can we measure that? And they said, well, we could put electrodes on the surface of the skin and measure the EMG potentials. So they did. And lo and behold, they, they found that their premise was correct. The interesting thing was when I searched PubMed and the Index to Chiropractic Literature and CINAHL and whatever else I could think of, I was only able to find one paper at that time on dyspanesis. And I thought, this is kind of curious. So I asked our engineers that had developed the Insight subluxation station if they ever heard of dyspanesis. Um, and the guy kind of smiled and he said, yeah, he said it's 15 minutes of fame came and went. And I said, well, why? It, it seems like these guys were really onto something. And he just kind of smirked and he said, uh, talk therapy on the couch and drugs don't fix dyspanesis. And that was even a greater insight for me. So we started doing work with surface EMG and looking at these patterns that had been identified in individuals that had been under long-term chiropractic care. You know, that was kind of a challenge to begin with because all of the reference data had been done with people that were a part of the random population. Now we had populations of people that were under chiropractic care that we were able to compile data on. And we said, wow, this is completely different. Uh, you know, the, the variation in signal, the standard deviations are much tighter. We see more symmetrical patterns. We see better coupling between the various regions of the spine. Um, so we developed reference data there and published it and so forth. And that was kind of the, the uh, dyspronesis aspect of it. And it's still a very exciting thing. I remember uh, having a conversation with a creature who was masquerading as a researcher at another college. And this individual said, well, you know, I don't believe in surface EMG. And I said, 
you don't believe in it. I didn't remember. Like it doesn't it was exist. A, yeah, it's it's not a it's not a theological phenomenon. Um, I can really show you it. A, this isn't a work of faith. They, they they really exist. These EMG machines. I know. I sell them. I make them. So no, no, no. I mean, I, it's not valid. And whenever anyone says something's not valid, I, I automatically follow with the question: Well, valid for what? And he said, well, it doesn't correlate with pain. And I said, well, of course not. It's a motor nerve test. It doesn't Congratulations. You're right. Yeah. You're you know, it's uh, not expected to be a pain thing. You know, there are other ways to measure pain. You can use a, a visual analog scale or an algometer or all kinds of stuff. Uh, but surface EMG, you know, it's a, it's a motor thing. I said, you know, you can't weigh a patient with a rectal thermometer. That's not what it's for. Um, it may have value in some clinical context, but it doesn't do that. So, you know, surface EMG, it doesn't measure pain, no. Um, so that kind of ended that. And what got me was another individual saying that he thought it was unethical for chiropractors to treat, as he called uh, asymptomatic patients. And I said, well, first of all, I don't consider chiropractic a treatment. I said, I call it a treat, not a treatment. I said, secondly, um, I can't think of any profession that doesn't consider it desirable to identify an asymptomatic phenomenon uh, before it wreaks havoc with the body. Right. So can you imagine going to a, a medical doctor, having your blood pressure checked? Well, what is it? You know, uh, 240 over 175. Well, what should I do? Well, nothing. Just wait till you stroke out. You know, that would be the ethical thing to do. Or, you know, a woman has a lump in her breast. Says, well, what should I do about this? The doctor says, well, wait till it metastasizes and starts to cause bone pain. Then we'll do something. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. And I said, well, of course it's ridiculous. And it's just as ridiculous to deny a patient analysis and correction of vertebral subluxation just because they're asymptomatic, especially in a world where we have the technology to objectively document neurological components of it. And that brings us to the last item, which is dysautonomia. And of course, as we know, the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that controls the organs, glands, and blood vessels. And if that's not working right, the person's not able to um, effectively adapt to the dynamics of life. So how can we assess that? Well, chiropractors have been doing that since the 1920s, uh, since the introduction of Doss Evans and BJ's neurocolometer, looking at changes in skin temperature. And in the old days, they thought it was due to hot nerves or inflamed nerves. Today, we know that it is more likely a phenomenon of sympathetic activity causing vasoconstriction, and therefore a difference in temperature left to right or top to bottom. And that's an element that we added. We said, you know, we'll, we'll use uh, high-tech infrared sensors rather than thermocouples. Uh, that way there's no physical contact with the patient. We can eliminate that dynamic. And we started looking at those temperature patterns and to our delight discovered that uh, there was a tremendous amount of research in this area. Um, we, of course, have the brake system, as with Gonstead work, where there's a reproducible blip um, at the segmental level that they feel is involved. Um, we have the pattern method, which is popular in the upper cervical world, looking at the overall pattern of thermal distribution. And then we discovered an interesting paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery that was published back in the 80s. Uh, and what these people did was look at temperatures at like points in the body, not just paraspinally. They did that, but they also did the extremities and the head and everything else. And basically what they reported was that although the temperatures would be changing in a healthy individual, the left to right differences, the, the so-called delta T or difference in temperature was very tightly controlled in individuals that didn't have some sort of sympathetic dysfunction. So um, 
we incorporated the Umatsu database in this as well, so that you can look at pattern, you can look for breaks, you can look for uh, those deviations in, in the reference data. Uh, but the most exciting part of this journey, which, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny, when I, when I speak at Sherman, the students often say, well, you're a Palmer graduate, why didn't you go to Sherman? I said, didn't exist. Why didn't you go to Life? Didn't exist. Why didn't you go to Life West? Didn't exist. Yes, I'm really that old. So, you know, I go back. Well, actually, it's kind of scary. I enrolled in Palmer in 1970. So next year will mark 50 years of, of being in the profession on, on one level or another. Congratulations. Yeah, so thanks. But the, the thing that really gets me juiced, and, and still does today, uh, Dr. Ross is here, he's waving. Um, yeah, I'm at my office of chairman is the concept of heart rate variability. And the cool thing about heart rate variability is that it's a way of looking at how well the autonomic system is adapting, what the balance is between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. Uh, though we're finding that's more complex than we originally thought more on that maybe in a bit. And what the person's overall adaptive capacity is. And the way heart rate variability works is that we just use some sort of technique to measure the time between systoles, the time between heartbeats. And the way it was traditionally done was with an electrocardiogram. And when we developed the insight technology, uh, instead of an electrocardiogram, we used what's called a plethysmograph. And that's a gizmo that uh, measures the blood flow in the finger. So every time there's a systole, there's a pulse wave, and, and it monitors that. That way you don't have to you know, mess around with chest electrodes and things like that. And basically the premise is, and it's kind of similar to the pattern idea, that if the body is adapting well, if the autonomic system is doing what it should be doing, there will be variability between the pulses. And again, I got into a discussion with a, a PhD basic science type guy about this. And he said, you know, I think you chiropractors are onto something, but you know, this business of the nervous system being in control of everything is just not right. Um, he said, I can remove a heart from an animal or even a human being, and it will continue to beat outside the body without any connection to the nervous system whatsoever. And I said, well, of course that's true, but let's continue this thought experiment. If the animal or person that you remove this heart from were able to start running, would the heart and the jug beat faster? And, you know, that was kind of a eureka moment for him. And he said, no. I said, remember, uh, the intrinsic pacemaker of the heart will do its thing without connection to the nervous system. And, you know, you have uh, a rate of about 100, 110 or so. Yeah. But the thing that modulates it, the thing that causes the heart to beat slower or faster is the innervation. Oh, okay. So what we're looking at is how well that system is working, how well the body is able to adapt as reflected in the relationship between the central nervous system and the heart. So with, with heart rate variability, we're looking basically at two major dynamics. Uh, one is the balance, the autonomic balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. And the other is the overall adaptive capacity. Now the sympathetic parasympathetic thing, I'll, I'll mention this because I teased you with it. It's not as simple as a seesaw. Uh, a study was done with skydivers and they wanted to see what the relationship there was. And what they found was pretty amazing. They found that when they looked at heart rate variability in skydivers, there was an increase in both sympathetic and parasympathetic modulation. So, you know, there was, the, there was the fight flight, there was the rush, there was the feeling of comfort and, and exhilaration. So it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Um, and the cool thing about heart rate variability is that when we, we tie it to the concept of stress, I, we, again, we go back to what my first chiropractor said over 50 years ago, you know, the body's perception of itself and the environment. If you perceive a challenge, as a threat, the nervous system goes into freeze, fight, flight, and all that bad stuff happens. 
what some people call the stress response. And I said, that's not the stress response. That's a stress response. There's a different one that nobody talks about. And that's what Hans Selye, who came up with the whole idea of stress and biological systems says, is you stress. Think of euphoria. You know, that's the good stuff. And that if you perceive a challenging event as an opportunity for growth rather than a threat, you go into a whole different physiologic response. And the thing that you need to do that effectively is a nervous system that's free from interference. So, you know, that's kind of a quick review of the 4D model. I know you've, you've covered it before in the past, but you, you really can't overdo it. But the other things that we covered in this paper are neuroplasticity and ephaptic transmission. Now, neuroplasticity is, is an interesting idea. You know, if we again go back to ancient biology, you know, the stuff that I learned way back when, what were we taught? You know, after the brain is built, brain cells just start dying, and it's downhill from there. You know, nothing you can do about it. You know, it just keeps going until so many have died that you die as, as an individual. Well, that's not a very inspiring high spiz perspective on life. But what we know now is that based on our experience, our life events, the brain can actually rewire itself. And that's something that's, that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Because when I had the stroke, you know, it affected one side of my body. And we had an early EEG device that we were working on in those days. And it was supposed to evaluate IQ. It didn't really work, but it wasn't my idea. I got it from a guy named Ertl. And Dr. Ertl was trying to find a physiologic measurement for IQ, which would avoid the cultural biases of paper and pencil tests. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. So anyway, he had this um, EEG program that looked at integration between the hemispheres and gave IQ numbers. So I'm hooked up to this contraption and I'm looking at it and, you know, on one side I'm Einstein plus and on the other side, uh, you know, I've got the IQ of a cucumber. And I thought, well, how can this possibly be? And again, as I continued to live life and continued to improve, neurologically, we started to see, you know, more activity in the affected side. So, um, you know, that's an example in, in, in one case of the brain rewiring and of other areas taking over functions where it was, was damaged. But the even more exciting aspect of neuroplasticity is that we know that various areas of the brain, at least the hippocampus, uh, regenerates, that we do have neural growth. Um, simple example of this are taxi drivers in London. What in the world is that? Well, taxi drivers in London have to pass an extremely difficult test uh, involving their knowledge of all the streets in London. And MRI studies have shown they actually have, you know, enlarged areas of the brain as a result of this. So how does this neuroplasticity tie in with the 4D model? Um, very nicely. The idea is that if we have a nervous system that's free from interference because a person's vertebral subluxations have been corrected, they're better able to perceive how they function in the environment and the brain is now getting good data that it can use to rewire itself to make it as efficient as possible. And, and the last thing we talked about in this paper was a faptic transmission and that's really wild stuff. Uh, a fapsis has to deal with non-synaptic communication and there are a number of contemporary neurological models that look at this. Um, one of the problems we have with the traditional synapse based system is that there are biological events that occur that can't be explained given the limitations of that system. You know, we know how long it takes a, a synapse to do its thing, to fire and, and re 
you generate. We know what nerve conduction velocities are. We can measure them and often do in neurodiagnostic work. But um, there's stuff that happens way too fast. You know, how do you, how do you catch a football? How do you fall in love? How do you, you know, all, all kinds of things that occur real fast. And we just covered a paper on, that, on purpose that um, I'm sure you'll look forward to where they did a study and they had people choose on a computer screen, either a set of red vertical lines or green horizontal lines, you know, just make the choice. Don't care what it is. Don't care why you made the choice. Just do it. And they did functional MRI studies while the person made the choice. And fMRI lets us look at patterns of activation in the brain. We're looking at um, oxygen utilization by neurons. Well, what they found was just so bizarre. Uh, they found that there were changes that they could consistently identify in the brain that happened 11 seconds before the person made their choice. Wow. Or before they pushed a button indicating their choice. Absolutely incredible stuff. You know, and we, we had talked before about how um, there had been some small studies suggesting that there was the potential for what they called retrocausality and and similar things but you know we were talking about milliseconds we were, we weren't talking about 11 full seconds so you know how can these things occur uh, well there are non-synaptic mechanisms associated with transmission and we're starting to learn more about those um, a number of years ago i was privileged to meet carl pribram at a conference and carl pribram proposed the holographic theory of brain function. And the idea here is that we can encode information in the brain holographically using things that are very similar to an optical hologram. And, you know, we've all seen those, you know, these space age looking 3D projections. And the way hologram works is kind of interesting. You take a laser which produces coherent light that is light of a single frequency with all the waves lined up. Uh, that's why a laser that's like only a milliwatt or a couple milliwatts in strength can be seen for miles because the beam is coherent and, and it's tight and we're not spreading photons all over the place. But anyway, with a hologram, you take that beam and you split it into two parts. One part you don't do anything to, that's called the reference beam. And the other one, you shine on the object and you take the reflected light, combine it with the object beam, with the uh, reference beam. The object beam and the reference beam are combined and they produce an interference pattern that kind of looks like ripples in a pond. You know, if you threw two stones in there and you looked at how the, the ripples interacted. So what the hologram is recording, unlike a photograph or, or an image on on a, a screen, you know, this, this, we, you're looking at your screen. What are you seeing? All these little pixels, thousands and thousands and thousands of little pixels. And if you block the pixels, what do you do? Well, you know, you block part of the picture. Not so with a hologram. With a hologram, you're recording information on how one can reconstruct the wave fronts that were present when the image was recorded, which is pretty amazing. So if you take a hologram, unlike a picture, if you break a picture, well, you know, you have the piece you have. If you break a hologram and you shine your trusty laser on it, you don't see a piece. You know, if it was a picture of you and I, you wouldn't see, you know, well, okay, I got the nose, you got the forehead. No, not like that at all. You see the entire image, but only from the perspective where it was recorded. So the cool thing about this is it literally occurs at the speed of light. And Pribram's suggestion was that we can encode information neurologically using holographic processes. And if that's true, um, if it's a true biological system and not just a metaphor, um, wow, you know, it, it, it really has incredible possibilities. Some other non-synaptic methods of transmission that have been identified 
are mechanical waves. You know, B.J. Palmer talked about uh, taut and tender fibers, and he talked about tone, and he often used the analogy of a musical string. And you know, we said, well, you know, that's a nice analogy. Well, it's more than an analogy. Uh, there actually have been studies done where they've put uh, tiny mirrors on nerves and shine a laser on the mirror, and they find that when the impulse is propagated, it's mechanical. And if you go back in history, uh, there was kind of the mechanical school versus the electrical school, and the electrical school prevailed, you know, with the Hodgkin-Huxley model. They said mainly because one of the principal proponents of the mechanical premise didn't speak English very well and wasn't as effective a communicator. So isn't that interesting? Uh, so anyway, lots of stuff in the wonderful world of neurophysiology. But what we're seeing that's exciting to me is that neuroscientists, people in other disciplines are, are really interested in this stuff. You know, there's some people in chiropractic saying that if you talk about vertebral subluxation, you'll never get published. Well, you know, this paper was published in Archives of Neurology and Neuroscience. I say, you know, and you, 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 know, you, you can't talk about this stuff at scientific meetings or they'll, they'll think you're crazy. Well, you know, I presented at uh, the European Neurology Conference and the uh, Global Congress on Neuroscience, and I talked about vertebral subluxation, and they accepted the paper. I even got a, a cool-looking certificate for one of them. So... Um, <laughs> Real scientists are very open to this stuff. You know, once you get out of the world of political medicine and the world of political chiropractic, and, you know, these were in other places. You know, one was in uh, Malaysia and the other was in uh, Venice, Italy. So there's a whole different world out there of open-minded people that are fascinated by what we do and, and would love to collaborate with us. So anyway, I'm talking too much you're not talking no, that enough, was so. actually what's really I'll funny is uh i was looking at this and uh and, and i know you know david fletcher and he just commented yeah. i could listen yeah. to this all day long and i am <laughs> like i wish i wish i didn't have any patience today because i could just sit here and just listen yeah i'm sure you have other classes and stuff yeah. you're teaching but yeah. that was awesome there's so much that we just went through so i want to just kind of unpack some of it well and, um, and david is as you probably know, taken over CLA, which yeah. developed the inside instrumentation, yeah. which is, for those not familiar with that, and is continuing to improve the technology. David's one of those people who, when he speaks, I record it because I understand maybe 30%, yeah. and I need to go like get a dictionary next to me because it's next, it's just next level all the time, and I'm like, I got to look this up. You started with, and it's actually one of my, <laughs> I'm laughing so hard because right before, uh, right before, you came on, I was uh, just going back through the paper. And um, in March of 2015, I was driving from Life University to, uh, to Dr. I know you had Jeremy and Amanda Hess on, the, uh, on, 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 on purpose in the past. And mm -hmm. I was driving down to their office down in Stockbridge, Georgia. And I pulled over and I was late to their office. I'm sorry, Dr. Jeremy, if you're listening, uh, because I heard you talk about your first chiropractic experience and what is it that chiropractors do? And I wrote, I pulled over and I took the note for those four points and I pulled it up before we did this in March 11th, 2015. And I think the thing that really impacted me was when we talk about how we distort, how subluxation distorts our perception of the world and limits our ability to appropriately respond to the environment. And then if we do this on a large enough scale, it can, to a significant amount of people, it creates a psycho-emotional consequence for a society. And uh, when we look at the stuff that, you know, BJ, DD talked about, um, you know, slip on a snowy side, slippery sidewalk, I'm blanking, right? It's just that that just breaks that down so well. And then we can go through the uh, dysautonomia. We can go through the information you talked about with dyspanesis where... Um, we can look at those patterns and it just makes so much sense for me when anecdotally or even research wise, we see these changes in these mental and emotional disturbances by just simply, you know, adjusting the spine. And uh, I want, just want to thank you so much for bringing that to the table and continuing to publish this type of work. And well, anyone who's interested in that, by the way, is, um, I have another paper 
on chiropractic and mental health. Yes. It was published in, what was it? Let me look. Uh, I got a copy of you. Journal of Neurology, Psychiatry, and Brain Science. And um, we reviewed the, the history of, you know, things like Clearview Sanitarium and mental health and chiropractic, and also talked about the putative neurological processes that might be involved. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, that's free online. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I've gone through that. I'm probably going to go through and just kind of break, just get on here and talk about you that. People say you have again. to be crazy to see a chiropractor. I said, no, you don't. But if you are, it'll help. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, this is why I've been listening to On Purpose. By the way, we have a lot of students who listen to this. You mm -hmm. guys have donated the entire library to Life. Mm -hmm. um, to Sherman, I'm sure, right? What other schools do you know of that have on purpose, have the on purpose library? Well, you know, at one time, most of them did because their policy was, if we get a request, we'll do it. And, and, and so I, I don't have a current list in front of me, but, but most do. The amusing thing is we actually had an uncanny phenomenon occur with the Anglo-European College of Chiropractic, which unsubscribed. <laughs> and basically they said, you know, even though it's free, we don't want it, you know, I, I right. presumably because their concept of chiropractic is antithetical to ours. And I'm pretty outspoken about some of the things that have been going on there. Um, so anyway, most of the colleges do that. And, and that offer remains open. If a, if a group of students is at a college that wants it, that's not getting it. And the library agrees to uh, accept it. Some of them don't. Yeah. Um, we're happy to provide them with a complimentary subscription. So if you're in school and you're in one of the schools listed or mentioned, uh, you can go back and get tape decks like back to the eighties and nineties of on purpose. And yeah, if we you used have to be on cassette. player in your car. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, CDs. We, we started with cassettes and then they stopped putting them in cars and they stopped making them. Uh, we even had a couple clients say, well, you know, I, I I want to get a new car, but the new cars don't have tape players in them. Well, no, they don't. And they, mm. they don't have a crank on the front either. Um, so, you know, our response to that was to transition to CDs. Right. And now cars don't have CD players in them. So now we have the um, audio subscription or the, so, uh, the online yeah, so digital now we subscription. Have the, we have the online availability. We have the, the apps for people that have portable devices. Those are kind of cool because, um, they're arranged topically. So if you've, if you've got an app on your phone uh, and you're standing in line somewhere and you've got two minutes, so you don't want to completely waste, you can say, oh, gee, hmm, heart rate variability and cancer prognosis. Yeah, I'll listen to that. And, you, know, you can listen to that for two minutes and enrich yourself. So we've, we've tried, and we also have MP3 downloads. So we've tried to evolve with the technology. I don't know what'll be next. Right, right. Well, I, if it makes you happy, you should know that uh, I have had a couple people from the Anglo-European uh, who are students there reach out to me who actually listen to this. So a couple of them. Oh, I know some great will students hear this. there. I, I know some great students there. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. Um, just really quickly, because I know you have like classes and stuff, and I want to take too much of your time. When we were going yeah, to this neuroplasticity, that's, why I gave you this. that's perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, we were going into neuroplasticity. Uh, the one thing that kind of um, I've I, I've been wondering and thinking, and I wanted to ask you about, uh, was that you've been really big on talking about the concept of neuroplasticity, and I completely agree with you. HRV, the thing that I love about like heart rate variability and the autonomic system, which isn't necessarily neuroplasticity, is just to show like you go search heart rate variability in PubMed, and you see multiple different professions talking about what oh, yeah. we as chiropractors see. So mm -hmm. it's it's out there. It's just if you're ignoring that research, you're just you're just ignorant. You're just making a decision to ignore it. Um, but you've also you're really big on talking about epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there if there is a connection or if there's like a tangible connection between this neuroplast neuroplasticity and epigenetic changes like Ashkani Jews as well, et cetera, that we've kind of broke down in the past. Um, that you can kind of see, is it a similar, just because the language yeah, kind of I think, sounds similar. I think the bridge is being built. Uh, in fact, uh, in um, a recent publication, they talked about the interaction between the genome, the epigenome, the endocrine system, and how this is all moderated by the nervous system. So yeah, we're, we're, we're starting to see that. We're seeing 
more discussion of how lifestyle choice affects uh, genetic expression and mm-hmm. how, again, the nervous system moderates this. There was a, a fascinating study done by Dean Ornish a while ago, and he's a medical doctor who was very much into wellness and lifestyle type stuff. And uh, they were always bugging him, saying, well, where's your research? Where's your research? Where's your research? So he did a, an experiment where there was a, a cohort of men with prostate cancer that had declined treatment, which is kind of interesting. So what he did was he looked at their epigenome, you know, how many genes were turned on and turned off. Uh, as a result of his wellness intervention, which is, you know, exercise, diet, lifestyle kinds of things. And he was amazed by the robust change there was in genetic expression as a result of making those choices. So again, if we go back to the idea of vertebral subluxation interfering with your perception of the world and your ability to respond to it, and how this will lead to transient neuroplastic changes. Actually, I have a timeline. I wish I could show it to you. But on one side of the continuum, we have the nervous response. That that happens real quick. You know, touch a hot stove, you withdraw. Very shortly thereafter, you feel the pain. Then we have neuroplasticity, where with repetition, uh, with more and more afferent input and and building on this reference we talked about holographically, we start to see both functional and anatomical changes in the brain, probably the spinal cord too. Um, And then the next step up is epigenetics, which typically lasts several generations. And beyond that, we have natural selection you know, where changes occur on a, on a much larger time frame. So we've, we've kind of got this continuum of adaptive change from the instantaneous stuff you have to do now to the long-term stuff that's necessary for the survival of the species. Uh, you know, and they've seen epigenetic changes in humans that have lasted uh, in people that were Holocaust survivors and people that were involved in famines and so forth that persist for several generations. So again, not forever. So, you know, as the body needs to become more efficient in the utilization of its resources, you know, these various mechanisms unfold. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I completely, I, I love seeing these changes and I love um, talking about this concept of how chiropractic care can not only help you, right, but like you can literally change the lives of your grandkids, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's all scale. You know, one of the things that Bruce Lipton said that really resonated with me, he said a cell can't be in growth and defense at the same time. Right. And I said, well, if that's true on a cellular level, it's true of an organism, it's true of a family, it's true of a profession, it's true of a country. Um, It's like the tensegrity arrays, uh, you know, the the things we have in the cytoskeleton that they again can be scaled and um, it just keeps on going. It's, it's pretty exciting stuff, you know, and then you get into fractal math and how that relates to nerve function. In fact, the latest stuff in heart rate variability is chaotic analysis and that's a whole new world. Yeah. That's like uh, bringing us back to like a woman ahead of her time. Um, subluxation and chaos theory. Sue mm-hmm. Brown which yeah. is one of my favorite, absolutely one of my favorite papers. That and the uh, role of subluxation in human evolution just completely, mm-hmm. just I had to put it down in the middle. It just challenged everything that I thought. Yeah, uh, and, and it's brilliant. To quote Lily Van Stoop in, <laughs> <laughs> what was that, uh, Blazing Saddles? It's yeah. two, it's two. You know, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I could I could probably do this all day. Yeah, we could. Uh, we're going to have things to do. I do it. Yes, before. we're going to have to. Uh, I, I hope that we can do this uh, again in the future. Um, maybe we can go through that mental health paper and talk about that or yeah. do something again. I would love to have you back on and we'll clear out like we'll just clear out an afternoon. Uh, we'll just clear out a day and just do yeah. it. 
or maybe not. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Anyway, I just want to thank you so much for joining me. Just really quickly, how anybody who wants to follow up with you, get in touch with you, read your work, listen mm-hmm. to you audially, the best way to get in contact with you and any parting words of wisdom you may have. Okay. My suggestion is to go to CairoOnPurpose.com, easy to remember, and that has um, information about becoming an On Purpose subscriber and so forth. Uh, my Facebook page, Christopher Kent, that's pretty easy to remember. Uh, you can have a look there. Uh, if you want to contact me personally, the best way is by email. Also very simple, ckent at sherman.edu. And what I'd like to leave you with, I guess, hmm, let's see, that the decisions you make and the actions that you take today affect not only you, your patients, and their immediate family, but ultimately the destiny of humanity. It is that big. Well, thank you so much. I hope you were listening because this was awesome. And uh, I just, I got so much from this. If you guys saw me looking down at all, uh, I was just burning notes. I was trying to do it while looking at you. So thank you so much. Um, for listening to another episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. Dr. Kent, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Guys, go slay some subluxations, and I love you all.